Thank you very much for joining us for today, for the symposium. Thank you. And uh, Bye -bye. we're now going to continue with um, a very different region. Um, we're now going to continue with um, another artist who's presenting her work here at the exhibition at Terrestrial Assemblage, Anna Alenzo. Um, and uh, a colleague of hers or a collaborator on a new book project, Ricardo Avella. Um, after talking about the regions around former <laughs> or, actual, um, or actual border areas in Korea and Europe, we're going to um, um, the Venezuelan Amazon. It seems that the Amazon is still viewed as a resource-rich region um, to be exploited or a pristine environment to be protected, a garden of Eden to be kept under glass. But the Amazon is not a vacant land or an uninhabited one. Um, it is a territory shaped by cities, towns and villages, by diverse peoples with their own cultures and economies. Therefore, each border that is created and imposed upon them has an impact on their lives. Please meet the artist Anna Alenzo, based in Berlin, and the architect uh, Ricardo Avello, Avella, based in Brussels. In uh, Anna Alenzo's work, she showcases the economic, social, and ecological risks in extractive practices of natural resources, such as oil or gold. Her work departs from the assumption that within the fragile state of geopolitics and the vulnerabilities of our society's artistic practices become modulators, shapeshifters, as we had earlier, of a widespread sense of uncertainty. Instead of rejecting this uncertainty, she identifies with it and embraces it as a vehicle for artistic experimentation. Um, so to say, staying with the trouble. Ricardo Avella co-founded a collective in young, of young professionals interested in the sustainable transformation of urban and natural landscapes, Colectivo 1061, um, I hope I spell it right, in 2012. As a landscape architect, he has, um, or as, an, as, a, as a trained architect, he has collaborated with various architecture firms in Turin and Caracas and works steadily in Venezuela and the Dominican Republic since 2011. In uh, We Are Satellites, they are going to present their exchange on ecological devastation caused by mining in the Venezuelan Amazon, um, which impact exceeds its own geography and reaches an existential planetary dimension. So we're going back to a global discussion and uh, uh, see the first um, collective work which is going to enter into a book project um, uh, that both of them are working on at the moment. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Let's just okay. check the sound for a minute. Yeah, Anna, can you? Hi, hello. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, good afternoon. So I would like to thank everyone for joining today, virtually, and there in the floating Berlin. Uh, yeah. Also, thanks to floating University, Carola Uck, and the curator Pauline and Kuma for inviting us to participate in this symposium, and of course, Ricardo Vela uh, for sharing this virtual space with me today. Uh, I will begin by showing uh, a five-minute uh, fragment of a video that is part of one of my most recent installations, uh, titled The Mind Gives, The Mind Takes. It is from this installation that the idea of we are satellites uh, emerged. Later, uh, Ricardo and I will engage uh, in a, a documentary and imaginative dialogue of image and context uh, to address the current situation in south of Venezuela, where the Guayana and the Venezuelan Amazon are located. Then we can start with the video.
At 12.13 local time, the satellite was launched. The rocket maintained its path and regular parameters until the satellite was placed into orbit. Sucre satellite reached an orbit synchronized with the Sun at a distance of 640 kilometers from Earth and will provide data for planning, environmental and natural disaster monitoring, natural resource management and national security. Sucre incorporates for the first time a high-definition camera and an infrared one that will allow a better monitoring on terrestrial resources. With a weight of around one ton and a storage capacity of a terabyte, this satellite joins the career for technological independence defended by Venezuela. Canaima is one of the main wonders of creation, unique in the world. Declared a national park on June 12, 1962, it is among the oldest and best preserved territories on the planet and was included on the World Heritage List in 1994. In this video from 2014, we can see the illegal Apoepo Campo Alegre mining complex located in the southeast of Canaima National Park on the right bank of the Caroni River in its upper basin. We can observe intense developments related to the mining of gold and probably diamonds. Such activity generally begins with the deforestation of the riverine forests. Then enormous holes are opened in the ground by hydraulic means from where the material containing the desired minerals is extracted. These enormous holes are transformed into mining lagoons of diverse contaminated colorations. Mercury and cyanide, extremely dangerous elements for both humans and ecosystems alike, are used to extract the gold from sediments. These are the settlements where the miners live. With satellite imagery from 2019, we can make a circular flight over this illegal, semi-industrial, technologically advanced mining complex with its well-planned camp infrastructure. None of these activities appear to be hidden. Steep hooies, steep cliffs, waterfalls, indigenous communities. We are satellites. We are millions of miles away. We are here and there. We are gold and diamond dust.
And now, Ricardo can continue with the presentation. Um, you can see the presentation now, right? Uh, one moment, I think they're just on it. I'm going to give you a yes. Uh, okay. One, um, one moment, Ricardo. Okay. Still uh, black right now. One moment. Still black screen. One moment, the technicians are just coming. I think there's uh, something wrong with the screen right now. Okay. Yes, now we're there. We see the slide now, and you can okay, begin. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, in recent times, uh, a series of global factors, such as the drop of oil prices in 2014, the rise of many mineral commodities like gold, combined with the collapse of the national economy in Venezuela, and with the loss of value of our currency, the Bolivar, uh, these factors combined have made the national government shift their attention from the oil fields of the country to the rainforest of the Venezuelan Amazon. In the Venezuelan Guyana, which is the largest and least populated region of the country, there are little more than 2 million inhabitants in a territory that is larger than the whole of Germany. There are large deposits of iron, bauxite, gold, diamonds, cobalt, copper, coltan, and many, many other rare, minimal, rare minerals. But this region has an incredibly rich biodiversity, both of vegetation and wildlife. There are more than 650 bird species, 300 different mammals, more than 1,200 fish species, and hundreds of different reptiles and insects. And there is also a diverse, uh, uh, it is also a diverse region from a social and cultural point of view, because there are 23 indigenous peoples that live there with their uh, uh, unique worldviews. And they have lived in, been living there for centuries. It is here in this region where the national government has created the largest mining project in Venezuelan history. It is branded the Porinoco Mining Arc. The area uh, open for mining concessions to global actors is as big as the Netherlands, Belgium, and Switzerland together. But the combination of global and national factors that I previously mentioned has also paved the way for the rise of illegal small-scale gold mining. Today, 80% of the illegal mining activities that take place in the entire Amazon are in Venezuela. And this type of mining has catastrophic externalities. Deforestation, loss of biodiversity, pollution of watersheds, violence, the outbreak of malaria, the destruction of the formal economy, and the threatening of indigenous livelihoods are only but some of these byproducts. Small-scale and artisanal gold mining is uh, very different from other types of uh, industrial mining. It is more expansive in its nature and extremely difficult to control. These diagrams that I show here uh, help to visualize the magnitude of scale of bauxite, iron, and gold mining in the Venezuelan Amazon. And they all have the same scale. In the first two diagrams, we can see the footprint of the industrial ore uh, of, the, of the industrial iron ore and bauxite mines of the entire region. Uh, and this is the footprint they have left over the span of 50 years. But if we compare it to the footprint of small-scale and artisanal gold mining in just one municipality 
of the state of Bolivar. In the past 20 years, we can see the difference. It is quite extreme. Another issue that is important to highlight is the impact these activities have in relation to economic, legal, and cultural boundaries. The mine of Campo Alegre that was previously shown in the, in the video will be used as an example to make an argument. The mine falls outside of the boundaries of the Orinoco mining art, as you can see. However, the creation of this mining project by the national government has accelerated the rise of artisanal and small-scale miners throughout the entire region. It becomes, in a way, an incentive. Uh, and this uh, rise of illegal mining doesn't fall only within the boundaries delimited by the government. The mine of Campo Alegre is also located inside another kind of boundary, that of the Canaima National Park. The extraction of natural resources is strictly forbidden in national parks and natural monuments, but mining is taking place in many protected natural areas nevertheless. These are paper parks, as uh, they call them, because the vastness of uh, protected areas in the region makes it extremely difficult for the uh, state to guarantee the enforcement of the law. We could also argue that the concept of a protected area leaves the rest of the forest unprotected and open to depletion. And this is something that needs to be revisited uh, in the context of climate change. Finally, the mine is also located in a territory that has been inhabited by the Temon peoples for centuries. Their rights to this territory have not been yet recognized by the state, uh, which has always had a paternalistic approach to indigenous peoples. And this approach serves also an extractive uh, agenda. The Venezuelan state has always had uh, rights to whatever lies in the subsoil, regardless of who owns or who occupies the land. Therefore, the existence of uh, resource-rich soils where indigenous peoples are living creates, as you can imagine, uh, a conflict, a conflict that uh, uh, a big conflict for the state because it leaves indigenous peoples powerless uh, and dependent. Uh, and meanwhile, the extractive project, be it legal or illegal, it doesn't make a difference. It advances strongly and threatens entire ways of life. But it must be said that the negative externalities of coal mining do not respect any of these boundaries or legal frameworks. Water flows, and if water is polluted with mercury, it flows downstream and poisons everything it touches. Artisanal and small-scale gold miners are nomads, and they have families in the towns and cities of the region, and they go there to cash their findings. So if they are infected with malaria, the disease will arrive in the cities nevertheless, even if they got the disease in a mine far away in the jungle. The, Wara the Warao people live in the Orinoco Delta. They live in a lowland where all the waters of the region come together. They are outside the Orinoco mining arc. There are no mines in the Orinoco Delta, but they are being poisoned because the waters where they swim and where they fish are heavily polluted with mercury. And these waters then flow to the Atlantic Ocean, to the shores of Trinidad and Tobago. And a similar thing happens with the mines of the Orinoco mining arc that are part of the Essequibo River Basin. They flow to Guyana and poison human and non-human forms of life in a country where no one really cares about what happens in Venezuela. The Amazon has historically been seen as a territory full of resources that is there to be exploited, or as a biodiversity and cultural haven that should be studied and preserved. Needless to say, this narrow dichotomy has always been imposed from the outside, and it is not a useful one, I think. One vision destroys, destroys land, water, and life. The other limits drastically the possibilities of the people that live in the villages, towns, and cities of this, of this region of Amazonia. Either way, dependencies exist because the economic opportunities in this region are extremely reduced. So a third way is urgently needed in Amazonia to guarantee a sustainable future that will be able to respect and coexist with all forms of life.
Now I pass the, the word to, to Anna. Hi, yes, <laughs> I'm here. You can hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, okay, perfect. So we keep the, the same image because I, I think it's, it's a good connection to our conversation. No? I think, and I will repeat this uh, sentence that we write for our abstract now. Uh, in order to reflect on the environmental destruction associated with mining, it is necessary to understand it, not only in a geographical level, but also in a existential, existential level. What do the pollution of rivers, the extermination of endemic plants, and the murder of animals and indigenous people in Venezuela means for us here in Germany or in Brussels? No? To what extent can we understand the planet Earth as a whole? To what extent is this even possible? I am part of a generation that has witnessed the destruction of the productive apparatus of Venezuela, and as a result, its social fabric. In a rather, rather drastic way, corruption has become established as a daily practice of survival. Because of this, and in addition to the drop in oil prices that Ricardo showed in his fear statistical table, people are surviving in a country with the highest hyperinflation in his recent history. Today, coal mining is supported and promoted by the regime in power, not to mention the guerrillas and mafias in church. Are you seeing the uh, image or because I don't? Right now, one moment. Uh, I think they're going to go back to the presentation. Can you show the one moment? Yeah, now we see it. OK, yeah, I will continue that. How do we decode and rethink the effect of this predatory logic? of this extractivist logic that has developed over centuries and has led to the belief that there is no other way, other way to live. When I began researching the subject of mining, I had an apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic vision. How long will it take then to destroy the ecosystem of Venezuela, Guayana, and Amazon. For me, approaching this topic means building networks with other peoples and specialists, listen, listening to multiple versions, studying the myth of the past, but also thinking and recognizing the myth of the present. That is how I met Ricardo and began the project of making an art book with other 12 contrib contributors from different fields. We hope to have the book published uh, at the end of, the, of this summer. Huh? But, yeah. The magnitude of the conflict we are dealing with seems as immense as the territory itself. Multiple layers and readings are possible. Eventually, I began to identify with satellites, orbiting an area from a distance, gathering and classifying information and data, generating new codes and new language. In fact, through satellite image, was yeah, it is through satellite image 
that I was able to study the geography of the territory. Are you seeing the yeah. working from a distance led me to use fictions and prototyping as a method to think and generate a different relationship with the problem of mining. Next. Next. What can we learn from the mechanism of gold mining? I have been studying the handmade and improvised mechanism used in illegal mining in the Amazon region, turning the so-called entame into a construct. To explore this further, I made my own tummy. Because this picture is part of an exhibition last uh, December in Gallery Bay in Berlin. On the other one are, are also part of an exhibition that is now closed because COVID, but is in, in Herne, it's called the uh, Ruadin. Yeah? We, we are expected to open that soon. Yeah? Okay, I continue. At first, I was fascinated by the sculptural potential of this tool. But then I recognized the deadly cycle that drives gold mining. The mercury that is used to cash the gold not only harms the gold miners, but also poison the air and the water, destroying the environment and the livelihood of the local population in long term. I began from a specific motivation which were transformed, transformed during the creative process. One, to recognize a current ecocide. Two, to recognize that in this process, there are also bodies and cultures in both. Three, to recognize that these bodies are absorbed by a criminal and corrupt machinery that has control over the entire Venezuelan territory. As I said before, there are many layers and possible readings, and maybe at least from an artistic point of view, of view, it is healthy to leave the ending open, the question without answers. I believe, and this is also one of my motivations, that approaching this type of subject matter through artistic research brings about a different awareness. The process of abstraction and transformation that take place, place in this mode of creation allow a certain access to that other level, more philosophical, material, and existential, from which new links and questions come up. To continue today's conversation, I would like to quote some words of the Venezuelan writer and curator Luis Perez Orama, who in a, in a recent interview said, our crisis, the Venezuelan crisis, is therefore not just political, economical, nor social, but strictly cultural. It has made us lack in real representation beyond myths and legends. And now I would like to close this question to Ricardo, with this question to Ricardo. No? Can the restructuring of the territory create the condition for a diversified and sustainable economy 
reducing the dependence of this region on resource extractions. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I think this is a, a very important question uh, because the promotion of economic alternatives in, in this region becomes crucial if we want to preserve the, the Venezuelan Amazon. In order to break the, the, the links of dependency that exist there today, that are in many ways also pushing people to do this to survive. Um, you know, according to endogenous growth theory, uh, can you see the slides that I'm showing? Yes, they're there. According to, according to endogenous growth theory, local initiatives should make use of the natural and cultural resources that are available in a particular territory. Unfortunately, these are very rich and diverse in the Venezuelan Amazon. Geographical features of unique scientific and ecological value, uh, extreme biodiverse vegetation and wildlife, 23 indigenous groups with their worldviews and biocentric approaches to life. All these things coexist here. So if the preconditions that are needed for local initiatives to thrive are facilitated, they could grow from the bottom up in a systemic way. Uh, for example, different forms of ecotourism could be promoted in the region. But even if we go beyond traditional notions of preservation and include a productive dimension uh, in it, uh, the forest could also support alternative economies. The harvesting of non-timber forest products like copwasu, acai, tonka beans, copaiba oil, uh, among many, many, many others, can provide means of livelihood to many communities, making them less dependent on non-renewable resources and on extraction. More importantly, these forest products have a great potential for the creation of added value. For example, tonka beans are used in the production of flavors, fragrances, cosmetics, and, and medicines. These products could be directly manufactured in the Amazon, which is something that is not happening today. And uh, this could create highly specialized economies, even in remote peripheral settlements. Um, an investigation I made on local initiatives in the region uh, made me realize that there are already many sustainable enterprises like this taking place today. Most of them deal with agroforestry, uh, ecotourism, capacity building programs. But the question remains, no? how can we multiply them? This is why I believe that it is crucial to put forward a vision for the Venezuelan Amazon, one that aims for a self-sufficient and productive region in which the necessary conditions for the growth of local initiatives are put in place so that people can make use of them uh, uh, and, and, and grow initiatives from the bottom up, especially if they intend to make use of the potential that is present in the territory in a sustainable way. This, mission, this vision would need to be paired with a regional strategy so that local initiatives may flourish in a systemic way, as I said. This is a fictional map that uh, shows a constellation of local and sustainable initiatives in the towns and villages of the region uh, if such a strategy were put in place. All these villages and towns uh, would be uh, ideally making use of the cultural and natural resources that are available in their surroundings, creating a virtuous cycle of self-reliance. But how do we make change in this difficult region? There are many, many challenges today. First, the national government, as Anna said, is promoting directly and indirectly both legal and illegal mining. Second, most of the mines are controlled by paramilitary and criminal groups. And uh, last but not least, there are many settlements in the region where people are sincerely proud of being miners. They have been miners for many generations. The, 
mining is being performed there for centuries. You know? uh, so for this, this is why the construction of a scenario matrix becomes interesting because it allows us to understand that even though the possibility of a sustainable and productive future exists in the Venezuelan Amazon, it is merely but one of several possible futures. There's a lot of uncertainty around uh, this region. Not all these futures are desirable. Not all of them are sustainable. The productive and endogenous scenario uh, can be deemed as the most desirable one for several reasons. First, because, the unique, because of the unique ecological and scientific value of the region. Second, because of the cultural richness of the indigenous populations that inhabit this territory. Uh, third, because of its peripheral condition, which makes people depend on small-scale mining, slash and burn, agriculture, logging, poaching, all these activities that are you know, highly unsustainable, highly unsustainable, basically because of the limited opportunities they have. And fourth, because of the risks posed by a national economy that has that only relies on resource extraction as has been the case of Venezuela for almost a hundred years now. But to not engage in resource extraction, uh, knowing that there are plenty of natural resources underground is a big and a very difficult decision for a developing country, especially if more than 80% of its population lives in poverty. And if the national economy has depended on oil for, yeah, as I mentioned, more than a hundred years, but there are plenty of opportunities for the construction of an alternative development path in this region, even if mining is not banned in the short term or even in the medium term. Development and preservation are not necessarily in conflict in the Amazon, but of course, new notions of development, and new notions of preservation need to be explored in this very fragile context. Um, however, for this to happen, awareness needs to be created among the population and in close cooperation with NGOs, civil society organizations, and of course with artists. In other words, the productive and endogenous scenario that aims for the promotion of local sustainable development can only be achieved if it is a shared vision of the future, a roadmap for all Venezuelans. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raquel. Well, I have a lot of uh, different questions already, but I think that we're going to need to wait a little bit longer because we're running out of time for the next speaker. Um, I hope that you're going to be available for a little bit longer, Anna and Ricardo. Um, now I'm going to introduce...